where he focuses on chronic disease prevention and sustainable lifestyle change. And today he'll be talking about, this is the third in the series of understanding medication, bowel management, the other two previous ones on dental care and um, pain management will, it, um, oh, osteoporosis, I'm sorry. They are archived on our We Foundation YouTube channel. And this one will be archived with that as well in the same playlist. So you can watch it later on next week. Now I'd like to turn it over to Jay. Hey, Jay. Hi, Julie. Thank you so much for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Um, so today we're going to talk about bowel management medications. Um, as Julie mentioned, I've done a couple of other seminars in the series of understanding your medications. So first one I did was for polypharmacy. Then we had three webinars on pain management. How do we really reduce the usage of opioid if we can? And we talked about opioids and addiction as well. And as Julie mentioned, osteoporosis and dental care were previous ones. And today is the final webinar, which will be available on ChristopherReed.org for, uh, website, as well as on our YouTube channel. So you're welcome to take notes, because I will be giving you a lot of information. Uh, but if you're not able to keep notes uh, uh, for whatever reason today, you can always go back to YouTube and listen at uh, uh, your convenience. So just a couple of notes about today's session. Uh, we know that understanding the medications improves our overall health. Uh, once we understand what are the side effects and the risk and benefit of the medications, uh, we can optimize those therapies for ourselves. And we also know that pro proper bowel management is essential for our overall health. So we'll be talking about both today, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, definitely, if you're listening to this on, uh, on a pre-recorded YouTube channel, then make sure that you check on the updates because pharmaceutical knowledge, uh, healthcare knowledge keeps improving with time. Uh, of course, work closely with your healthcare team and uh, do your research on your own to stay educated. Mostly, I will use the generic name of the medications, but I'll also use some brand names so that you, know, you feel connected with the product. You may not be familiar with the generic names. However, I want to... Uh, uh, disclose that I have no financial interest with any of those pharmaceutical companies. I've taken also some uh, images from the cyberspace, which may not be individually acknowledged. And uh, this content is for educational purposes only. It's not to replace what your doctor, what your nurse, what your pharmacist can advise you. Uh, so please uh, take the information. Uh, Okay, sorry for the technical issues. Um, please let us know that you can hear us, and I'll have Jay continue. Hi, can everybody hear me? Hang on just a minute, I'm asking Julie? everybody. Yes. Yep. Oh, okay, perfect. we're on now. Great. Thank you. You can go ahead. Thank you, Julie. For, thank you, Julie, for fixing this technical glitch so quickly. Appreciate it. All right, so we'll talk about we're the GI asked, tract. Um, if uh, you can speak louder, Jay. Sorry. Okay. No, that's fine. Thank you. So keep interrupting me if I'm not sounding good. <laughs> thank you. All right, so we'll talk about the anatomy and physiology of the GI tract. Uh, with special consideration for people who are living with spinal cord injuries. We'll talk about all the medications which can improve the bowel function, but also the medications which can negatively impact the bowel function. Uh, we'll talk about some natural strategies as well. So let's start with the anatomy and physiology of the GI tract. So GI tract um, is kind of really um, my favorite uh, organ system in the body because it's so simple and, but very elaborate. And once you understand how it works, and if there's any problem, you can fix it yourself as well. So I want to give you a quick glimpse of this so that you can see where the problem might be and how can you fix it, uh, um, fix the problem if when, as and when it appears. 
So the digestive process actually starts in the mouth, not in the stomach, not in the intestine. It starts with the mouth, with the saliva. So saliva has a lot of enzymes, and when we chew our food, it mixes well with the salivary enzymes, which starts to break down the food immediately. It also moistens the food so it can travel down to the esophagus, the food pipe, and going into the stomach. Now, when food, and also the saliva is very alkaline, so the digestion process, particularly for uh, carbohydrates, starts in the mouth uh, with an enzyme called thylene. So there are many more enzymes which start that process. So when the food arrives in the stomach, the stomach has very low pH. That means it's a very acidic environment. The pH is 1.5 to maximum 2.5. So that helps in not just breaking down the food, but also killing all the microbes. So pepsin uh, helps in digestion of the proteins, the lipase break down the fat, and the churning action of the stomach also helps in mixing those enzymes with the food, so then it can eventually be propelled down into the small intestine. The small intestine has three parts to it. We have ileum, uh, duodenum to start with, and which is like a U shape, and then comes to jejunum and then ileum. So we have enzymes again coming from pancreas, which go right into the duodenum, and then we have bile, which comes from the gallbladder, uh, from the liver, that also gets dumped into the uh, duodenum, the the first part of the small intestine. So again, more breakdown for the protein. Protein gets broken down to peptides and then into amino acids, so it can now be absorbed into the bloodstream. Same with complex carbohydrates, they get broken down into sucrose and then into glucose and uh, uh, fructose, so then it gets absorbed into the bloodstream. Lipids get broken down to fatty acids, so that can be absorbed. So most of this uh, final uh, breaking down of the food and absorption happens in the intestine, which can be up to six meters long. So it's a very long track where absorption is happening. Now, whatever is left over, which is not absorbed by the body, arrives in the large intestine, and large intestine starts to reabsorb the water. So this is very important for people with spinal cord injury to, injury to understand that when the reabsorption starts, and if it's too much water gets reabsorbed, it uh, becomes very dry, leading to constipation. So whatever is left goes into the, uh, into the rectum, and from the rectum, it gets eliminated through the anus. So that's the final exit point. Large intestine also has a lot of microbiome, which is required for healthy digestion of the food, plus also boosting our immune system. So we'll talk about that a little later. So just to summarize this, uh, and also the peristalsis. So peristalsis is the movement which starts in the esophagus. So in the mouth, we have the control. But then the esophagus, the food pipe has peristalsis, stomach and all both parts of intestine have peristalsis. So those muscular contractions help the, move, uh, help the food to move through the entire system. So GI tract helps with the digestion of the food, absorption of the food into the bloodstream, so it can go into every cell of the body wherever it is needed, and finally eliminating whatever does not get digested. Gut also works like a security guard for killing all those bacteria which is there and all those nutrients which body doesn't need gets ushered out. Approximately 70% of a body's immune system is concentrated in the GI tract. So GI tract is not just about getting the nutrients into the body, we are also boosting the immune system. Also for the mental health, the GI tract plays a very, very important role. Uh, some people call it the second brain. We'll talk about that uh, in this uh, presentation as well. So back to spinal cord injury. So most spinal cord injuries cause something called neurogenic bowel. Uh, so simple mechanism of action for neurogenic bowel is that there's a change in the nerves which are supplying the messages to the large intestine as well as the rectum and the anus. So if there are changes slow down into the large intestine, the peristaltic movement is slower, it is gonna take longer time to 
pass the food through the large intestine, so more water gets absorbed out of the feces. And more water getting absorbed leads to harder stool, causes constipation. And if there's a change in the nerves supplying to the rectum and anus, that could lead to incontinence, uh, those accidents um, which can happen. So there, depending on the injury level, there are two types of neurogenic bowel. Uh, people who have an injury at T12 or maybe L1, uh, above that, so that's called upper motor neuron bowel syndrome. So this is also known as reflexive bowel. So we don't have time to get into a lot of details about it, but the good news is because it's reflexive bowel, so besides medicines, people can, uh, the oral medicines, people also can use rectal suppositories and digital stimulation for this injury. Uh, this injury is also related with autonomic dysreflexia, which I'm gonna explain in the next slide. People who have injury at level L1 or below that, they will have something called lower motor neuron bowel syndrome, which means flaccid bowel, so it becomes like kind of lazy bowel. So that leads to not just constipation, but also incontinence. Uh, there's risk of hemorrhoids and rectal suppositories and uh, digital stimulation are usually not effective when people have that injury below L1. So autonomic dysreflexia is something which is a secondary condition, uh, which happens mostly to, to people who have injury at T6 or above that, and it can be a life-threatening condition. So it is mostly connected with bowel and the bladder function. So it's very important for us to learn about the improving the bladder and the bowel function. So today we're gonna to focus on bowel function. Um, so what happens with autonomic dysreflexia, the autonomic nervous system overreacts to that situation which can be impacted by, you know, bladder is too full or constipation or there's impaction in the GI tract and that increases the blood pressure. And blood pressure can spike up so high that it could lead to stroke. So you need to really understand that with your providers, your healthcare team, that what kind of triggers can happen, what are the signs of it, and you need to respond to that as an emergency. So Reef Foundation has a lot of resources so that you can understand autonomic dysreflexia. Uh, you can get a wallet card, it can be mailed to your home, or you can, you know, you can check it out online as well and download it online. So ChristopherReef.org is a website if you want to check that out. So we talked about how important is the bowel care. It affects almost every part of the body. Uh, for people with SCI, disruption in regular elimin elimination can lead to not just autonomic dysreflexia, but fecal impaction, hemorrhoids, diarrhea, incontinence, worsening pain. So we're gonna talk about that in this presentation. So the bowel program definitely includes medicines, but it also includes some of the techniques and changes in the diet. So we're gonna get into this stool awareness. So having a stool diary for people who have challenge managing, managing their bowels is one of the first steps you can do. Just noticing what is your stool size, how consistent it is, the routine, the, the colon, the GI tract loves some consistency, some routine. Uh, most of the body actually is looking for a balance all the time what we call is homeostasis. Frequency, how frequently you go. It's recommended that you have at least uh, once a day evacuation, if not every other day. Uh, so keeping a food diary, what kind of food improved the bowel management for you and what kind of food made it worse. Uh, if there's any changes in the bowel uh, management, it could be diarrhea, it could be blood in the stool, it could be fever, so any of those things happen, they could be an emergency, so check with your healthcare team, calling your doctor immediately for those. All right, let's jump into the medications part now. Uh, so we're gonna cover these three aspects. We have wonderful questions, a lot of questions for people who signed up. Uh, laxatives, antidiarrheals, and hemorrhoids. So these were the three main uh, category of medications we use, and there were questions around all three of them. So I'm gonna cover this before I answer those questions, and hopefully I don't have to answer every question then. 
So most of the laxatives, fortunately, are available over the counter. They can be administered orally, that means through the mouth, and some of them can be administered rectally. So rectally, we can give a suppository or use the enemas. A rectal administration usually takes less time to act. So maximum within an hour, people will have a bowel movement. So all the laxatives we have out there fall into one of these nine categories. Most common, the first category is the bulk forming uh, agents. So we'll talk in detail about each one of them. So psyllium husk, for example, stool softeners or the emollients. The third category is we have a lot of medications in this category called hyperosmotics, so osmotic ag agents. Fourth one is lubricants. Then we have stimulant laxatives. And then we have four more categories of medications which are newer. Uh, these are all available on prescription only, and they can be very expensive. Jury is still out there whether they are more effective than over-the-counter products or not, uh, but they could be an option for some people, so we're going to talk briefly about these medicines as well. And then we will talk about suppositories, animals, and mini animals. And before we jump into the drugs, I would like to go over some of the simple uh, things you need to be aware of about all the laxatives. Uh, and then we'll go into the specific laxative category. All right, so let's begin with the overall uh, counseling points, what you really need to be aware of. The first thing is, what do you need to report to your healthcare team? When do you call your doctor? What can you check with your pharmacist? So bottom line, I recommend this for every medicine. Please tell all your medicines you take, including over-the-counter products, herbals, vitamins, supplements, if you're using medical marijuana, CBD oil, anything you take, please tell both your doctor and the pharmacist. Make sure that they document all those products in their EMR and the pharmacist in the pharmacy profile <clears throat> so they can check for drug interactions. They also need to make sure that the risk of each medication you take is also lower than the benefit. So if the benefit is higher and the risk is lower, that's a good medicine. So if the medicine is causing a side effect of constipation, we might want to address that. Then specifically, if you have nausea, vomiting, you have bleeding uh, in the rectum or in the stool, you have pain, cramping, so that you need to probably call the doctor as well. Allergic reactions can happen. Having your doctor and pharmacy review all the ingredients of the medications, particularly if you have allergies. So some of the products might contain food dyes, might have preservatives, might have too much sugar in it might be high sugar. So if you have, if you are on restricted diet, so watch out for those things as well. You want to avoid these products unless they are directed by your physician. So first thing you want to avoid is being severely dehydrated. Most laxatives do not work if you are dehydrated. Now what that means is you're not drinking enough water but also maybe you're drinking too many fluids, which is not water. So for example, the alcohol, soda, uh, caffeinated drinks, they all are liquids, they're fluids, but they can make your body dehydrated. Uh, caffeine, for example, can eliminate a lot of water from your body. So watching for that. So if you hydrate yourself with water, there's a possibility you don't even need a laxative. So, just giving you this pointer here that you don't really need medicines and take them only if you need them. So hydration is the first thing to watch for. Of course, as I mentioned, if you have any stomach conditions, any abdominal cramp, it could be appendix or intestine related, uh, check with your doctor. If you had some recent surgery and that is causing some obstruction in the bowel, that needs to be referred as well. Um, some of the vitamin and mineral deficiencies can become worse when you take laxatives. So we'll talk about that. Please consult that with your doctor as well as the pharmacist can help you. If you are pregnant or breastfeeding, uh, you need to specifically check with the doctor as well because not every medicine has been tested on people who are pregnant or maybe feeding, doing breastfeeding. If it's children, I had a couple of questions about children, and some people are older adults, so 
not every medication is recommended uh, for these two populations as well. That needs to be referred to the doctor as well. And be on alert for sweating or seizures uh, with these medications or with anything else. So they can also interact with your bowel management. Okay. So following the directions, so checking with your pharmacist or doctor, pharmacist can help you with over-the-counter products, and if it's a prescription-only items, you can check with the doctor and pharmacist both. So using them as per the directions only. Don't overdose them because that can lead to diarrhea. That can cause other problems as well. If you miss a dose, don't double it up uh, next day. So skip that dose, at least for most laxatives. This is what the recommendation is. Please do not double the dose next day. If you're using a liquid form, make sure you get the correct dose because if you're using a household teaspoon, you know those teaspoons come in all different sizes. So using a kitchen measure or from the pharmacy, you can buy a calibrated measuring device. So using the exact volume or exact number of drops is very important. Uh, make sure you drink enough fluids while using any of these laxatives. Um, the side effects, so any side effect, I'm going to talk individually about each laxative, what kind of side effects you can have. Uh, but if you have any of the side effects, please let the doctor know. And if it is something which is not a commonly known side effect, please report it to FDA. This is how FDA collects the data, and uh, they can put it as an education for the doctors, education for the patients, that if other people are also suffering from it. And this is like a general... Um, uh, point for everybody. It doesn't matter what medication you take, you're supposed to report it to FDA to help overall the whole world. Okay, so checking on hydration, uh, hydration sodium and potassium levels uh, you know, fluctuate big time with hydration, so making sure that we have enough minerals in the body. Uh, Long-term use of these laxatives is also not recommended. I understand people with SCI might need to use some long-term uh, laxatives, so we'll talk about those, which, can, which ones can be used and which ones should not be used. But, of course, working with your healthcare team is very critical. Um, except for stool softeners and bulk forming agents, which I'm going to discuss first, uh, long-term use of uh, other laxatives is not recommended because that can cause more concerns in the long term. This is more of the general recommendation for all medications, keeping medicines in closed containers, away from heat, moisture, and direct light. Heat, moisture, and direct light can damage medications, uh, so that means you don't want to leave them in your car. Uh, definitely do not store your medicines in the bathroom, and I know a lot of people do that. Uh, so bathrooms are the worst place to store your medicines because of the moisture and the heat. Uh, in the bathroom can destroy the potency of your medications. If you're using suppositories, uh, they're supposed to be semi-solid, so keeping them below 86 degrees, uh, keep them from freezing, uh, keeping all the medications out of reach of children and pets, so they come with a uh, child-proof caps, most of the medications, the tablet forms, but over-the-counter products may not be in child-proof uh, child packs. So if you know somebody accidentally swallows any of those, uh, you can call the Poison Control Center. I have the phone number here. Uh, checking on the expiration date of the medication, that's another big problem which happens to many of us. We have the medication which are expired. Uh, they are usually not recommended because we don't know chemically when they convert, what are they converting into. And if you have more questions on those, I would be happy to answer those. And disposing of the medications properly, the medications you're not using anymore or will not need in future or they are expired, they need to be disposed of. All right, so we're going to switch gears and jump into each category of laxatives, and the first category is bulk forming agents. So how these medications work, these are mostly like uh, uh, soluble fiber which swells in the GI tract and hold more water. So when this uh, soluble fiber swells and holding more water, it gives more uh, bulk to the stool. And with that bulk, the GI tract gets more stimulated, the rectum feels more weight, and it helps in evacuation. Most of these products fall into these three categories, methyl cellulose, polycarbophyll, and psyllium husk. 
Chilium husk has been around for hundreds of years, um, but some of these brand names are on the slides. Um, so two potential uses, it can be used for constipation, but it can also be used for diarrhea. So for hard stool, uh, it can create a bulk and help, in, help with constipation, but if you have diarrhea, it can create that bulk, absorbing that water together so that runny stools will stop. All these products are available over the counter as tablets, powder, chews, gummies, capsules, wafers, so you can try all these different forms, uh, but watch out for the sugar content. Uh, the cautions or the side effects, these products can cause gas, bloating, abdominal pain, cramping. So I recommend you start with a small dose. Um, they can also bind with drugs, other medications you take. So digoxin or levothyroxine, the drugs which go in very, very small doses, they particularly are going to be affected by these bulk forming agents. So what I recommend is, or any pharmacist would say, please keep those medications at least two hours away from your bulk forming agents. If you are using a powder form like Meramucil or something like that, make sure you never ingest that dry powder directly. You want to mix it with a liquid uh, and the water is the preferred liquid to mix. And when you're preparing the mixture, make sure you do not inhale the powder because when you inhale it goes into the lungs, it can cause more problems. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, my slides are acting out a little bit. I think I got it. Okay. All right. So the most important thing to remember here is if you do not drink enough water and you're taking a bulk forming agent, it can actually cause more constipation for you because it will take all the water from your GI tract and it will cause more impaction. So please drink a lot of water. If you are on restricted fluid diet, definitely dis discuss that with your doctor and you want to avoid this category of laxatives. If also you have problems swallowing um, food or you have uh, food pipe strictures, uh, if you are using a nasogastric tube or gastric tube, this category of laxatives is not recommended. Some of these brands might have a lot of sugar. They might be sugar-free versions out there. They might be with no artificial sweeteners. They might be, have some food dyes. So research that part. I personally recommend reduce the chemical burden in your body as much as you can. Um, so if you can find something which is free from sugar, free from artificial chemicals and sweeteners, that would be better. And of course, you want to involve your healthcare team if you have any more questions on this. Looking at the second category called emollients or the stool softeners, very popular, very commonly used. Uh, they're pretty safe for people with spinal cord injuries as well. So the way they work is they uh, allow more water to be absorbed into the stool. So more water is retained into the large intestine, into the colon, so that's how it becomes softer. Some of the studies say like they also help retaining some of the fat into the GI tract. That also makes the stool softer. The biggest advantage of this category of medication is that it keeps you away from straining. So if you have hard stool, you might start to push it. Um, you might want to strain, so it reduces the strain. So people who have hemorrhoids, definitely stool softeners can be um, a good category of laxatives for you. So they don't uh, cause the bowel movement, but they help you avoiding the strain. They, as a side effect, if you're taking too much of that, they can cause diarrhea, mild nausea, some abdominal cramping, and most commonly used tool softener is docusate. So docusate comes in two forms, docusate sodium and docusate calcium. Efficacy-wise, they are very similar. So some of the brand names are Colace and Surfac. Colace is very common, very commonly used by people. So one of the cautions here is do not mix docusate with mineral oil. So mineral oil is another laxative. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But if you take mineral oil with docusate, uh, it can increase the absorption of mineral oil. 
Now, mineral oil works only if it does not get absorbed by small intestine. It does not have to go into the uh, bloodstream. So we want to keep it in the GI tract, and docuset can create a problem there. So watch out for that. The next category is hyperosmotics. So there's a very simple uh, phenomenon of physics where if there's something separated by a semi-permeable membrane, the water automatically moves in the direction where it needs to move. So depending on the concentration, if there's a high concentration on one side, the water will move towards that side to make it less concentrated. So that's a phenomenon. So what that means is if you have more water on one side, it will help you reduce that on the other side. Okay, so it helps in, so if you have less water in the intestine, it will draw the fluids into the intestine, and by doing that, it will make the stool softer. Uh, these category of medication can cause electrolyte imbalance, so I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Uh, there are four main varieties. So saline, lactulose, glycerin, and polymers. Now, they also can cause uh, dehydration and make you feel more thirsty because it's trying to retain that water into the intestine, not enough water is going into your bloodstream. So just a reminder, keep drinking more water. Uh, and if you have restriction, making sure you discuss that with your doctor. So let's jump into the first one. First category is called saline laxatives. So the saline is, for example, magnesium citrate or magnesium hydroxide. Uh, in larger doses, they can cause diarrhea, pain, cramping. So I would say start with a lower dose and see how your body responds to it. Saline laxatives need to be avoided if you, your kidney function is not optimum because that can cause accumulation of magnesium in the body and can cause kidney failure. Lactulose is the only one in this category which I'm discussing is available by prescription only. Many countries out there in the world, because I know this webinar is attended by people all over the world, so in many countries you can buy it over the counter, including in uh, Canada, but in America it's available by prescription only. Uh, usually we use it higher doses, like 15 to 60 ml a day, so we are talking about half ounce to up to two ounces a day. Uh, this product, lactulose, is also used for hep uh, liver disease called hepatic encephalopathy. So this needs to be avoided if person has diabetes. So it can increase your blood sugar levels. So just watch out for that. The third product in this category is glycerin, which is simple. It's used only as a suppository. Um, it has hyperosmotic effect uh, right in the rectum area. So it brings more water into the uh, rectum. And it also causes stimulant effect because of another chemical in the supposedly called sodium stearate. The biggest caution I would watch for uh, here in this would be finding the correct size. So it comes in pediatric size as well as adult size. Uh, we use it for even babies. So those are liquid suppositories. So watch out that you're using the right product. The fourth category in hyperosmotic has two varieties available. It is, comes with electrolytes as well as uh, without electrolytes. So the products with electrolytes, like Golightly, Neutrilightly, or Trilight, you know, they are used for colonoscopy bowel prep. I just put this as a joke, it's a joke in, at least in the pharmacy world, that, you know, with Golightly, you don't really go lightly. Uh, so they are good for colonoscopy bowel prep, but we are not talking about those today. So polyethylene glycol without electrolytes, for example, brand name Miralax, but it's also available as generic. So that's over the counter. It's also available on prescription. Most insurance companies pay for it. So it's a very effective medication. Um, effect is much milder. It's not very harsh on the GI tract. It's relatively palatable. Uh, as compared to with electrolytes, it doesn't taste good at all. And it has less side effects as compared to other laxatives. So this is one of the uh, hyperosmotics, polyethylene glycol, or Relax, which is very commonly prescribed or recommended by healthcare professionals. So we just talked about lubricant laxatives like mineral oil. So how mineral oil works is it does not get absorbed in from the uh, small intestine. It, leads, uh, it reaches the colon and creates a waterproof film 
around the stool as well as in the intestine. So the water cannot be absorbed from the uh, stool. So that will make it, you know, uh, help it pass easier and won't cause constipation. So it can be used orally or it can be given rectally as well. Uh, if you're taking it orally, you want to avoid uh, certain items which can, be, uh, which can be soluble in the fats. For example, fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, and K will dissolve into mineral oil, so they need to be spaced out by at least two hours. So you can take your multivitamin, you can take your vitamins, but spacing it out by at least two hours. If you're taking a stool softener, um, as I mentioned before, that can help in absorption of mineral oil, so it's going to kill the efficacy of mineral oil, so they should not be taken together. Uh, it can be a little harsh on the GI tract, so it's recommended that you do not use mineral oil for more than one week at a time. And if you think you want to use it more often, please check with your doctor. Then comes the stimulant laxatives. Uh, again, they work really awesome. They increase the intestinal motility. The peristaltic movement improves. Uh, they cause some local irritation in the mucosa as well as the intestinal muscles. So it's kind of really, really good, but they can be really harsh on the GI tract. Uh, if you're using it for a very long time, it can lead to a tonic colon, also known as lazy colon. So you keep whipping it, keep pushing the uh, stuff out from the GI tract so it stops responding or it becomes slow in responding. So definitely recommended uh, that you do not use it on a regular basis. You can sporadically use if your doctor allows you to do it. So people with without spinal cord injury, they can use it once in a while, but people with SCI, with spinal cord injuries, please check with your doctor if you have to use it regularly. Usually they work much faster. Uh, they work within six hours. So most of those medications we take at that time. By morning, you will have a good bowel movement. Um, but they can take up to 24 hours to work as well, depending on you know, your age, your system, how sluggish the system is, and your food and lifestyle habits. Uh, of course, the suppositories, anything you're inserting in the rectum, usually will work within 60 minutes. Sometimes it can work within 5, 10 minutes as well. Um, so watch out for that. Uh, may cause abdominal pain, particularly if you're taking higher dose. It can cause a lot of cramping and, of course, diarrhea. Uh, you need to separate stimulant laxatives by at least an hour from anything to do with uh, GI tract. For example, all the antacids, the PPIs, which reduce the acid, you know, your omeprazole, esmoprazole, rilosec, nexium kind of medications, S2 agonist, you know, so the medications you're taking for um, heartburn, they need to be spaced out. So there are two medications in this category, the bisacodyle and the sana. So sana is, a, sana is the leaves of a plant. Uh, 8.6 milligram is kind of a standard dose. Uh, it also comes in 15 milligram and higher doses but usually 8.6 milligram, one or two tablets a day does the trick. And Dulcolax or Bisacodyl is five to 15 milligrams a day. So these are all the medications which are available over the counter except for lactulose, and they're very effective. Uh, constipation is a very common problem in our society because of our food habits and uh, sedentary lifestyle. Unfortunately, people with spinal cord injury, it's the percentage of people who have constipation is much higher. So you can use those laxatives, but with caution. So that's why I shared some detailed information with you. Now, if none of these medications are working for you, then we have some newer medications which are available only on prescription. So I'm gonna put them all together for you. So they fall into four major categories. Now the jury is still out there if they are better than over-the-counter products or not. So they have some fancier mechanism of action, uh, but they may not be as effective or more effective than OTC product. Another problem with these, all these products is they're very expensive. So amount of money you or your insurance company is gonna spend in a month for these product, you can get at least a year, maybe several years worth of over-the-counter 
uh, leg Z is the other leg Z is which we just discussed. Uh, one more thing I wanted to highlight people who live in America and over the counter products are definitely not covered by Medicare. Um, so you can ask your pharmacist, uh, they are mostly covered by Medicaid. So many of you I know are eligible for Medicare and Medicaid both. And I know many of the healthcare professionals are on this call. So if you have dual eligible clients working with you, so they have Medicare and Medicaid both, pharmacist tries Medicare, they get a rejection, just telling them to try the Medicaid, you will get a paid claim. So you most probably you won't have to pay any money for over-the-counter products. If you have more questions on this, um, you're welcome to send me a message about those. Okay, so calcium channel activators. Amitiza was one of the first in this category. It helps in retaining more fluid. It has been approved for chronic constipation, but also opioid-induced constipation. The second category is uh, guanylate cyclase C agonist. Again, do this the same thing. It increases the fluid in the intestine and also helps moving the stool through a little faster. Uh, so there are two products in the, this category, Linzas and TrueLens. Both are approved for chronic idiopathic constipation. Sounds fancy, but idiopathic does be, means that when we don't know what causes constipation, that's when we use it. I recommend that you figure out what is causing your constipation and then accordingly pick the right product. Uh, serotonin receptor agonist, this is the only category I could find uh, the brand name called Motegrity, which has been successfully tested in a pilot study for people with spinal cord injury. So other medications, I haven't really seen any studies that people with, with spinal cord injury got a benefit from that product, but with this brand, uh, there was some success. And many people with spinal cord injury have chronic pain, they might be taking opioids. Uh, so please listen to my webinars on pain management. There were three of them. So see if you can reduce your dose of opioids without compromising on your pain management. But if you are taking opioids, there are three products, Movantin, Relistor, and Symproic, which could be helpful uh, with uh, bowel management. However, if you look at the, this bullet, I don't know if you can see my cursor. It says uh, these medications however, lead to only extra one bowel movement per week. So it's not a dramatic improvement in bowel management. Getting one extra bowel movement could be big improvement for some of you in a week, but for some of you who have a bowel management program where you go to the bathroom every single day, it may not have a drastic improvement for you. All right, so we have Anima. So we have covered all the laxatives. Going to talk about mini enemas now. Uh, so, in enemas, you insert a liquid into the rectum. Uh, liquid can be water or it could be hyper or smaller salt solution. What that means is putting a little bit more of the salt in there so that mechanically it stimulates and retains water in the rectum. So, after you hold the liquid in the rectum, uh, you will have an uh, urge to evacuate the bowel. What is recommended is you want to hold it for a few minutes. If you get an immediate urge, you will not be softening the, um, the solid fecal matter sitting in the rectum. So you want to keep it in there for a little bit so you can evacuate that solid impacted uh, stools as well. Now, full-size enemas, Fleet is one of the brands. Uh, then really not recommended for people with spinal cord injury because it can trigger autonomic dysreflexia. And a fleet anema also has a lot of phosphates, so it's not recommended for people who have any kidney function compromise. So many animals uh, are recommended for people with SCI because it stimulates only the lower co colon, uh, the large intestine, and can be used more regularly. Of course, if you have any signs of bleeding in the stool or the rectal bleeding, any pain, discomfort, blistering, burning, itching, you may want to check with your doctor immediately. So suppositories. So suppositories are the semi-solid form, which can be directly inserted. They are usually small, rounded, or cone-shaped. Uh, they dissolve by the heat in the body. So most of the suppositories base is either uh, glycerin or it is uh, cocoa butter. So they are not supposed to melt at room temperature, but they melt at the body temperature. Um, 
So some people try to lubricate the suppository. I recommend don't do that, particularly not with mineral oil or petroleum jelly. Just maybe the temperature might be uh, different. So if they're a little bit warmer, if you're putting them in fridge, you know, it will be hard to insert. But usually a good suppository just is easy to insert. Uh, it can give the medication some chance to work. Uh, it can take 10 to 15 minutes, a little more time than the liquid, more time than the animals. Um, over a period of time, they can damage the nerves in the colon wall, so it's not recommended for long-term use. Uh, one precaution, it sounds kind of uh, obvious for people who are using suppositories right now, but if you have never used a suppository, uh, I've seen people coming back and saying that they forgot to take the wrapper out. So it's very important you uh, unwrap the suppository before inserting it. Otherwise, it can lead to cuts, and of course, suppository is not going to work. So two examples are the sequodial, which is a stimulant, and the glycerin, which is hyperosmotic. We talked about it. So these are the two medications very commonly available as rectal suppositories. There were a bunch of questions uh, which people submitted ahead of time while registering for this webinar, asking about what if I have diarrhea? So that's part of bowel management program, and diarrhea can be caused by several different issues. So I recommend in every webinar I've talked about it. So it's not just the symptom of a disease or discomfort you have, finding out what is causing it. So you want to find the cause and fix the cause of the problem, not just manage the symptom of the problem. So what can cause diarrhea? So you may want to think about it yourself or discuss with your healthcare team. Uh, in uh, people who are experiencing constipation as a regular part of uh, bowel management program, it could be just your medication. You're taking too much of your laxative. So cutting down on the dose of laxative could help with that. Uh, if you were given an antibiotic, many antibiotics who do not get fully absorbed might stay in your intestine. It might stay in your large intestine and kill good bacteria, good, might kill normal flora of the intestine. That can cause diarrhea. So the treatment would be very different for that. It could be related to your food. So that's why I talked about your food diary in the beginning. So there could be some items which are actually causing constipation for you or might be causing diarrhea. Uh, is there an emotional component? So we know, we talked about gut as the second brain. Uh, if you are too stressed out, we are not able to relax the uh, inner uh, anal sphincters so we can uh, pass the stool. So there might be that. Um, is it something to do with an infection? Uh, people who travel, we have something called traveler's diarrhea. So that those bacteria which uh, our GI tract is not used to, that could cause uh, diarrhea as well. So again, finding out what's causing the problem the treatment will be very, very different. So it's not one treatment for everybody. So one medication which is available over the counter and also on prescription, uh, very commonly recommended for diarrhea is called loperamide. Loperamide, uh, Imodium is the brand name, but it is recommended only for relieving the symptom of the diarrhea. So if you have, say, for example, infection in the GI tract, uh, it's not going to kill those, that infection. It's not going to kill those bad, bad, bad bacteria. So it's not recommended in that situation at all. So as I said, it treats the symptom but not the cause of the problem. Uh, if you're using a chewable form, make sure you take it empty stomach and chew it well. Uh, they're rapidly dissolving tablets also. They dissolve, they kind of crumble in your hands, so make sure that your hands are dry. If your hands are wet, it will start to dissolve in your hands itself. Uh, uh, another caution, which I am hoping everybody knows about it, that diarrhea can cause dehydration. Uh, what that means is some people think if they have diarrhea, they have watery stool, they stop drinking water. Uh, so it sounds reasonable, but that's very counterproductive. So because you're losing a lot of minerals and water in diarrhea, you need to supplement that. So please drink extra water to avoid dehydration in case of diarrhea. And of course, you're going to check with your healthcare team immediately. So side effects of loperamide, constipation, obviously, but drowsiness, nausea, vomiting are common side effects, uh, stomach and abdominal discomfort, which can happen because of diarrhea, 
but it can happen with a medicine as well. Um, if you have heart conditions, I would avoid this medication because it can cause cardiac arrhythmias, and in, leo, in the higher doses, it can also cause you know, heart failure, fatal ventricular arrhythmia. So it's not just because it's available over the counter, it's safe. Uh, that's not the wisdom here, so please watch out for that. Children and older adults might be more sensitive to the side effects, particularly for older adults with cardiac conditions, so uh, watch out for using of loperamide. I'll be against using it. Uh, definitely not use it without your doctor's consult and watching out for dehydration as well. All right, so the third part which I wanted to cover besides laxatives and antidiarrheals is the hemorrhoid medications. So people with chronic constipation, the stool becomes too dry, you're not evacuating completely, so you have a tendency to push, and when you're pushing, that can lead to hemorrhoids. So there are a lot of medications out there, but they're all depending on your symptoms. Uh, so I kind of try to break it down in a way so you can see the symptom and see the medication or the treatment for that. So the first thing is preventing it, okay? So if you're using a stool softener, it will hopefully avoid the strain. You want to avoid prolonged bowel movement sessions. So people with spinal cord injury might have to spend more time to evacuate, but do not use that time to push the stool because that can lead to hemorrhoids. If you do have hemorrhoids, you can use something, uh, some protectants, so something like Vaseline or cocoa butter. It will just soothe the skin around the exit point, which is the anus. Uh, so creating a barrier there, preventing the irritation during the bowel movement. Astringent wipes are available with witch hazel, hazel. So those astringent wipes like tucks, you know, they can help with uh, uh, burning sensation or cleaning the area. So while you're cleaning, but you're a burning sensation, which hazel calms it down. Local anesthesia, so if you have pain and irritation in the area because of hemorrhoids, so you need local anesthesia. So topical creams uh, or even uh, suppository. So usually these local anesthetics are recommended only outside, not inside the rectum, okay? So they will just numb that area and reduce the pain level. Uh, these may also minimize that autonomic nervous system going crazy uh, and causing an episode of uh, autonomic dysreflexia. So they could be really helpful in case of uh, hemorrhoids. There are some products uh, like Preparation Edge. Now, Preparation Edge, like all these brand, now, brand names, are available with multiple ingredients. So before you pick a product, uh, look for what does it contain. Uh, so depending on the ingredient, it will have different effects. And if you're not sure, you can always check with your pharmacist, hey, I'm taking this preparation match versus this one. What is the difference? And then you can match with your symptoms. So preparation edge with phenylephrine can help reduce the swelling and also reduce the burning and the itching sensations. Uh, so they have very mild side effects. Could be mild nausea. It could cause more stinging, more swelling, burning. Dizziness, drowsiness, hydrocortisone 1% cream can reduce the itch in short term. I would, it is available over the counter, but I would recommend checking with the doctor before you start using it for severe itch. There are several products available uh, through prescription only, like Proctofoam, but there's no data that they work better than over the counter products which contain similar ingredients. So. Just studying it up a little bit more, and if you have more questions on this, I would be happy to answer those as well. Uh, oh, by the way, for the questions, I'm going to go over most of the questions today, uh, but if we run out of time, which we might run out of time, so please ask those questions in the chat box in uh, the YouTube channel when the video is up and running, which will be within the next couple of days. Uh, I will be happy to answer those questions there. Um, so looking at the cause, you may want to also look at what medications can cause constipation or diarrhea. So if your medication is causing constipation, your doctor might want to consider, or you may want to discuss with your doctor, can you reduce the dose of those medications or can you change those medications to something else? So many of the painkillers, acid reducers, so we don't have time to go through each of the product, but over-the-counter products like uh, Peptobismol, 
Anticholinergics are everywhere. Anticholinergics example would be like over-the-counter Benadryl, over-the-counter sleep medication, but also prescription medications which are used for depression, uh, for insomnia. You know, those medications are not recommended. They can cause constipation. Many of the antihypertensives in the category of calcium channel blockers, narcotic pain relievers, we know about opioids, uh, anti-epilepsy medication, which are also used for pain management, your Neurontin and Lyrica, they might be causing constipation for you. Uh, many people with SCI use muscle relaxants, so baclofen, tizanidine, diazepam. They are also notorious for causing constipation. Some of the antidepressants, many medications for the mental health conditions and for urinary bladder issues. So these are some of the medications which are commonly prescribed for people with SCI could be causing constipation. So this is where your active understanding of medications and your active discussion with your doctor and pharmacist could help you uh, reduce some of the medications and changing them around in a way that your benefit with these medications is higher than the risk. So some of the supplements, uh, calcium and iron are also um, notorious for causing constipation. And these are the drugs which can cause diarrhea. So many of the over-the-counter NSAIDs, pain medications, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they can cause diarrhea, but antibiotics we talked about, um, particularly I can think of amoxicillin, augmentin, they're really notorious for causing diarrhea. Many of the PPIs and antacids can cause that, metformin, ACE inhibitors, which is antihypertensive. We talked about bisphosphonates in the last uh, webinar. These are the medications for osteoporosis, uh, many of the chemotherapy medications. And if you're taking magnesium, magnesium citrate or hydroxide or oxide, it could be a supplement. It could be medication for constipation. So all these things can cause diarrhea. So I'm sorry I went through the slides a little faster. Uh, you can always check back these slides uh, on the YouTube channel. So some of the additional approaches is talking, talk about nutrition. Your insurance com might cover a visit with a dietitian or a nutritionist at least, uh, figuring out what foods really overstimulate your bowel or cause constipation for you. So these are just some hints for you. You can look at your diet, uh, but your own food diary will help you the most because you will see which food items cause constipation or diarrhea. Uh, of course, looking at the water guidelines, I would avoid all the fluids except for the water. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, looking at the supplements, uh, also supporting the gut. So movements. So I know people with spinal cord injuries cannot move every part of the body, but move what you can. Very critical. So I've been teaching seated therapeutic yoga, improving the range of motion, moving what you can move. Uh, so it not only help the yoga helps with movements of the body, but also help elicit the relaxation response. So when we are stressed out, we don't want to go to the bathroom. That's not the time to go to the bathroom. Whole body is ready to fight or fly. Um, so that's the stress response. Opposite of that is relaxation response. So learning to meditate, learning to relax yourself. All those parts of yoga can really help you improve your bowel management. There's some electrical stimulation uh, can be used for some people. Acupuncture, electroacupuncture, they have been shown to improve constipation symptoms. Abdominal massages can improve the transit time. So they reduce the transit time, so can reduce the um, uh, constipation by increasing the frequency of the bowel movements per day, per day or per week. Uh, colonics, where we push the water in and suck the uh, uh, the stool out is normally not recommended for people with SCI. It can cause permanent physical damage, but they definitely reduce or create more imbalance by taking the natural bacteria, the you know, the healthy bacteria, the good bacteria in the gut. They can also be sucked out of the body, so they're not recommended. Um, you can try to restore the balance of the gut flora if that is an issue with probiotics or prebiotics. So prebiotics are the products which your good bacteria like, so eating those foods which will feed the good bacteria, and probiotics are full of good bacteria. So you can take them both together, so 
So those good bacteria will survive. They have enough food in the uh, colon. So they will help with your immune function, with the GI tract, reduce inflammation, but also support your mental health. So we saw, talked about mental and emotional health as well. It can affect your um, bowel movements, so enteric nervous system, stress hormones. So some of the serotonin uh, enhancers can lead to diarrhea. So a lot of uh, SSRIs, antidepressants, if you're taking too much of those, if you have chronic diarrhea, it could be because of those medications. So multiple studies have shown that psychology-based approaches can improve the digestive systems as well. So please do not discount the power of your mind uh, when it comes to bowel management. So I'm going to give you a quick summary here of uh, what we talked about. So know your physician and know your pharmacist. Uh, tell them about all the medications you take don't feel shy. Pharmacists are the most accessible health professionals you have out there. Uh, they're always eager to answer your questions. Uh, no stupid question there. Many people ask me, like, can I ask you a stupid question? Every question is intelligent because you have that question. So please ask more questions from your pharmacist, and I'm sure they will like it better. Uh, get a full MTM session. So people on Medicare and people who have... Uh, who take more than five medications a day uh, can ask for medication therapy management session with your pharmacist. So you can actually sit down with your pharmacist, go over every medicine to find out which medication you can cut down or which medication you can need to increase or add or delete. So a lot of things can happen in that uh, interaction with the pharmacist. There are a lot of free apps available out there. One app which I always recommend is knowyourmatch.com. So they're not always selling you something like, okay, now there's a paid version available. So with this app, you can actually be more compliant with your medications. It can just remind you when to take which medication. Plus, it will update you on the warnings and you know the knowledge about the medicine. So please use the technology so that you stay current on your knowledge of uh, the medications. If you just prescribe medication, use it only for you and have them reviewed on a regular basis. Don't share your medicine with other people. Storing and disposing of the medicines appropriately. Another reminder, please do not store your medicines in uh, your bathroom. Um, also, please research non-pharmacological options. Sometimes it is just so easy for uh, people to take medicines, uh, but they also have a lot of side effects. So uh, using non-pharmacological interventions for deprescribing, reducing the chemical burden on your own body so you can improve the quality of your health. But doing it in concurrence with your doctor is very important. So, so thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in and listening. Uh, we are above the time right now, but I'm going to take some more questions here. Um, so you're welcome to tune out or you know listen to it later but I'm going to address some questions right now. Um, Julie, is that okay with you to go over time now? Absolutely. You have more time. Great, Julie. Thank you. All right. So the first question I'm reading here is, what are the best practices for older person with high-level spinal cord injury to keep bowels regular? Uh, so I hope the presentation was helpful uh, because I gave you a uh, lot of options here. Uh, since you have high-level uh, spinal cord injury, you are a good candidate for digital stimulation, which we did not talk about in detail here. And you can, you're also eligible, possibly, for rectal suppositories. So please check that with your uh, physician and your healthcare team. Uh, next question is medications when stool is too loose. So we talked about that. So find out why the stools are loose and accordingly uh, do the treatment. And worst case scenario, you will use loperamide, but only um, if you really need it. Next question is, can I maintain a healthy GI tract while taking stool softeners, Tana, and a daily suppository? How can I repair my gut flora while taking all of these? Uh, and can these be replaced with foods while keeping to a regular daily bowel schedule? Great question. Thank you for asking that. So. Um, I'm sure I gave you a lot of ideas in this presentation, but uh, I would definitely consider prebiotics and probiotics 
uh, finding out which one is going to work really good for you. Uh, they can be really, really helpful for repairing the gut flora. Sometimes people just take probiotics or prebiotics, but not both together. So please study that up a little bit more. What Next question is, what questions should people ask their physician regarding medications and their side effects to protect them from increasing bowel problems? Uh, so the biggest thing I recommend, which I have already said that in this webinar, is discussing the risk and benefits of every prescription. Uh, so pharmacists will give you a lot of literature. It comes, you know, you can Google it, but whenever a pharmacist gives you literature, to study, please read it. And all those questions need to be addressed. Uh, and having a discussion on deprescribing is also uh, very, very critical because if the medications are causing bowel problems, uh, we need to really change them around. Uh, next question is, what is the cause of stomach gases? Uh, so the gases are actually not in stomach as much as they are in the lower part of the GI tract. The stomach gases can be released by burping uh, but the lower GI tract, those gases are kind of more obnoxious. Uh, so watching the food, uh, what food, the food items which we know can cause more gas, you know, beans and stuff, uh, and watching if laxatives are causing it. Uh, so some of the stimulant laxatives can cause it, bulk laxatives might be contributing, so watching for those things as well. Next question I have is when digital stimulation, stool softeners, Movantic is no longer an option. What can be done? Bowel movement is every 10 days or more, and round stools always present. There's no urge to have bowel movement on opioid medications. What are the options? So thank you for asking this question, and I'm uh, sorry you are dealing with a lot of challenges here. Movement every 10 days is not optimal. This has to be more frequent in my understanding. Uh, otherwise, there's more risk for your body. Um, so hopefully you learned at least one new thing today in this webinar, uh, which you have not tried so far, and you may ask your doctor about it and try it. Um, I would also strongly urge that you discuss uh, uh, with your provider about opioid deprescribing. Uh, we have learned in studies now that opioids in some cases are no better than even over-the-counter Tylenol or Motrin, Ibuprofen, you know, those kind of products. So please listen to those webinars which are on YouTube, uh, ReFoundation's uh, YouTube channel, and see you can extract some wisdom out of that and help yourself not being so constipated. Next question, how can I relieve constipation without drugs? So I think I addressed that already a little bit, but uh, uh, Assessing what is causing the problem, uh, what is causing constipation, that's the first step. And then, of course, food and exercise can help uh, relieving constipation as well. Uh, dehydration, I find a very, very common problem as well. So just fixing the, uh, improving the water intake could fix the problem for a lot of people. My hubby had a brainstem injury in 1969. Does that count? He's having problem with his bowels. Can you address this too? He's taking iron pills plus heart medication. Um, sorry to hear that. He's been dealing with this problem for a long time. Okay, so uh, iron pills, um, they can cause constipation as well. So I shared that in the, uh, in the presentation. Hopefully you'll get more tips. But checking on the iron pills, checking with the pharmacist, maybe the form of iron he's taking is causing constipation for him as well. So uh, if it is ferrous sulfate, that's the worst option for him. If it is ferrous gluconate or ferrous fumarate, it might be a little better. So it could be just such a simple fix that I'm not saying don't take iron, but take the right form of iron. Can we improve his iron level from his diet? Uh, can we give iron pill with vitamin C? So it's not the amount of iron people take, it's the amount of iron which gets absorbed which is powerful, which really helps with anemia, right? So if you're taking iron pill, maybe taking a lower dose, maybe taking a ferrous fumarate and taking it with vitamin C, improving iron in your diet and taking it with vitamin C will help with anemia better without the side effect. 
So a simple tweak like that might be helpful for him. I'm hoping this will be recorded and I can watch it at a later date. Yes, absolutely, it is being recorded. Next question is, uh, what can I do, eat, or take to make bowels firmer? Right now, it's like soft serve ice cream, okay? So bulk forming laxatives, so I'm sure you learned uh, definitely some category of medication which can help you, but bulk forming laxatives like psyllium or metamucil could be uh, helpful for you. What are the effective treatments for hemorrhoids? So we discussed that in detail as well. So that's the list of questions I see here. Um, so um, we are over time right now, so I really appreciate that you tuned in uh, and asked these wonderful questions. I really appreciate that. So please, when the video gets posted, you'll get an email. Uh, please uh, go to the YouTube channel uh, on this PowerPoint. Please ask those questions, and I'll do my best to respond. Uh, so I hope you all have a great day and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, everybody, for attending. And uh, a reminder, what Jay said, this presentation is being recorded and will be archived on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash foundation. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending us today on this beautiful Saturday. And everybody, please stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Bye-bye.